This is a story that began in the summer of last year. For me and my 12,000 brothers in the New York City Fire Department, life was good. And I had my blue little navy pants on. And I yellow stripes right down the side. Little did we know during the warm, pleasant summer that our lives were soon going to be completely shattered beyond comprehension. Let's go, baby. I'm Mike Puzzaferi. I'm a battalion chief in the 27 Battalion in the Fire Department of the City of New York. <laughs> My job is to supervise the men in command operations. A firefighter's job is the best in the world. The excitement, the adrenaline rush. Not knowing what's coming around the next corner. The split-second decisions to be made while risking your life to save another's from death. Above all, it's my job to bring my people home safely. That's what it's all about. In June, I was stationed in the 4-5 Battalion in Queens on a temporary assignment. One afternoon, British filmmaker Paul Bereff came to see me. Paul wanted to make a feature film about the work of a New York fire chief. He was soon going to get his movie, but neither Paul nor I could have ever imagined the nightmare that was waiting just around the corner. It started as a lovely morning that Tuesday in September. But at 0846 hours, it all changed. Life as we knew it came to a wrenching stop. It appears the airplane crashed into the World I was at my sister Lisa's apartment, helping her get her son Michael ready for school. But Paul was already heading down the east side of New York toward the Blazing Towers. Two hijacked planes had been slammed deliberately into the Twin Towers. Their fuel load of 10,000 gallons ignited immediately. In the towers, which at that time of day housed about 15,000 people, there must have been complete panic. Many were spilling out into the street. This is a US airline, it was a plane, commercial plane coming towards us. I said, it's gonna hit my building, it's gonna hit my building. All of a sudden, it made a left hand turn and a right, and it hit. All of a sudden, the whole downtown area just shook. It just literally, I thought it was an earthquake at, at 1.2, and then. You could literally see the whole thing just explode. It was, it was horrible. Within minutes of arrival, a fifth alarm was transmitted for a major incident in a high-rise building. All right, task force, sorry, Chief Gansey, fifth alarm, West investing. Fifty units were arriving on the streets below. On board, the men were thinking this fire would be one hell of a fight. But for many of them, this would be their last alarm. Our communications room was being deluged with calls from desperate people trapped high in the towers. We're getting reports on the 104th floor, back room 25 to 30 people trapped. I also have the 103rd floor, 103, with people trapped also. I have the 80th floor. 
When the wind shifted, firefighters could see at least five floors completely involved in fire. They knew that for those inside, conditions would be dire. As the jet fuel cascaded from floor to floor, burning everything in its path, it grew in volume, fed by oxygen, sucked through the elevator shafts in the center core. The temperature of 2,000 degrees blasted everything that got in its way. Those who survived the initial impact would be incinerated in seconds. 45 minutes into the incident, 1,000 feet below, 500 firefighters have already arrived. Surrounding them are the remains of passengers from Flight 175. Over 100 firefighters had already been given orders and entered the two buildings. On West Street, Assistant Commissioner Steve Gregory had arrived, directly below the South Tower, with Safety Battalion Chief Arthur Lachiotis. They were setting up a command post. Paul Bereff had joined them with his camera. Everything was going as planned. Units were arriving and being sent to work. For some, these would be their final moments. And then it happened. It was 0955. Over 2,000 people, including 343 of my brothers, had just perished. Commissioner Steve Gregory and Safety Chief Arthur Lachiotis were thrown to the ground and survived. Paul Bereff was injured and later recovered, but some of the others that had been around them were not so lucky. Terrible. You've been at it all night. Oh, all weekend, mate. Started Friday, <laughs> only just finished. Can you finish your thing? Always like to smell my best, and this time I've had a bit of help. New Gel Blue. It cleans with a foamy, fresh fragrance every flush. Mmm. And it stays fresh because you simply top it up whenever you like. Well, you never know who might pay a visit. For a fresher loo, try New Gel Blue. Sarah Johnson is a new recruit. Well done! Go! Oh. Sign up! Get her all back. You pay a fortune for this at the gym? Shut up! Just get up there now! Right to the top! That's oh. it! You make some great friends. Stop waffling, go! Come on, come on, come on! And later, she's having a really thrilling night at Bingo because there's £35 million in prizes actually won every week. 11, all the ones, number 11. Oh, number 11. No wonder Britain's bingoing mad! Peacock blue, shocking pink, peach glow. Or how about natural sparkling white? Pearl Drops is a tooth polish that can make a real difference to your teeth. The whiteness guide lets you see the results. Pearl Drops. See the whiteness, feel the shine, or your money back. They were so afraid, but yet they kept going up. All the way down, people were very positive. People coughing and crying. I started running down the stairs ahead of everybody. We went in on the 31st floor to make phone calls. 9-11, A Tale of Two Towers, Saturday at 7.30 on 5. Since September 11th, I had been working almost constantly at Ground Zero. 
It was like being in a daze, and everything had become a blur to me. Day and night, I supervised the men in the search operations, but it was only now, in October, that the realization of what had happened had begun to sink in. It was at ground zero that I saw Paul again. Good morning, hey John. Hey, how's everything? Right, right, right. Glad you're all right. How yeah, are you? yeah, I'm fine. I gotta go over. Our daily job was to search the areas below where the grapplers had removed debris, particularly the new voids that may have contained bodies. We were looking for anything, that is to say anything that would lead to an identity. We were hoping for complete bodies, but that was going to be a rare occasion. Any remnant of a body might help to bring closure to a family or loved one. We were satisfied to find the smallest bone. This is how it's been since day one. Oh, it's unbelievable. And this is six weeks later, almost six weeks later. And as we get closer to the center of this, it gets hotter and hotter. It's probably 1,500 degrees. We've had some small windows into um, what we thought was a core at some point, and it looked like a, uh, an oven. You know, it was just roaring inside. And it's just a bright, bright reddish orange color. See that stuff he's pulling out? What was that, Chief? You're gonna hold, we're going to hold off on the water. See the stuff he's pulling out? Yeah. yeah. It's red hot. If we hit it too much steam, you won't be able to see okay. what it's doing. Great. My men were so enthusiastic to find remains that they had to be ordered to take breaks. There was a fellow up in a void, and you know, they don't want to stop searching the voids. So our biggest and the biggest job for the safety chief is keeping the boys in a safe spot. How you doing? How are you? Thank you. Oh, thanks. Safety Chief Arthur Lacayotis was under the South Tower that morning with Steve Gregory when the collapse occurred. He, like all of us that were there, has to keep going back to that place. I don't know which was worse, watching the people jump or knowing what was going to happen. I felt terrible for the poor people that were jumping off a of Tower One that I saw. But there's nothing we could do to help this feeling. There's nothing we could do for them. There was just too much fire, and the elevators were all out, so the guys who were trying to get up there had to walk up 80, 90 floors with all the equipment. It just takes time. still pretty much surreal. Like you're gonna wake up someday and it's just a bullshit bad dream, but I'm gonna see it's not. It'll take time. It's been four weeks since the disaster. Of the 343 firefighters lost, only a few of them have been found. One of them is firefighter Billy Lake. Billy was a member of Rescue Two stationed in Brooklyn. They were one of the first to respond, and seven members of the company were killed. 
Billy was 44 years old and left behind a brother, Brian, a captain in Brooklyn, and Kyler, his seven-year-old son. For Kyler, growing up and facing the future without his daddy, life is going to be tough. Steve Gregory, as assistant commissioner, is trying to attend as many funerals as possible. But he and everyone else is still reeling from the shock. <clears throat> the events of that day still haunt him. Well, I'm definitely changed. I, I, I sort of live every day now for today and I'll worry about tomorrow. I always was a planner and I was going to do this at a certain point in time, but now I, uh, now I just do it because the way things go, you don't know if you're gonna be around to uh, do it. I've seen too many people uh, go that day that uh, probably were planning a lot of things and unfortunately never got to do them. Such is the brotherhood of the New York Fire Department. A single death affects every firehouse in the city. 343 in one incident was way too big to comprehend. A staggering loss, but even so, we wanted to give every one of them a full ceremonial funeral. We're going to a funeral for Michael Lynch, and he's one of 27 Battalion's firefighters. He's in. Uh, assigned to Ladder Company 32, and, and uh, significant parts of his body have been found at the World Trade Center. It's the opportunity for a family to go full circle, I guess, from the beginning of all this, from the beginning to uh, now, and they can finally put their son, brother, to rest. Mike Lynch's parents, Jack and Kathleen, watched the burning towers collapse on TV. They could see that things were bad, and they knew Michael was likely to be involved. All they could do was wait for news. We stood by the phone. At about one o'clock in the afternoon, we realized that Michael was probably in the collapse. We got a call and found out Michael's truck and Michael's engine was missing. Engine 40, truck 35, there was 12 missing. I went down there two days after the collapse and I saw the, the devastation, the catastrophic devastation. And I knew when I looked at it, I knew that nobody who was in there had survived. As I went down there each day, working with seven other fathers who had lost their sons, helping to dig. I think we all, I think we just wanted to make sure that we recovered something. And on March 31st, I was fortunate that I got a call that they had found Michael's body. And we were able to take him home and, and we had a difficulty getting the body from the medical examiner because, uh, which is kind of consoling in one way, is be, my wife says, because when they found Michael's body, he was intermingled with a female. His body and the female's body were intermingled. So the medical examiner told us that he was either protecting a person or carrying the person. And if he died that way, we're very grateful that that's the way he died. It's a daily thing, you know, you w we wake up in the morning and it's so just strange that you expect to see him walking through the door smiling. You know he's not going to. I probably go to my grave with this loss, always missing the physical presence of Michael. His siblings will, will probably, you know, be able to handle it 
bloody zero nine one. But personally, I don't think I'll ever get over the loss of mine. As September 11th drifted away, we kept doing what we do best. Through night and day are those moments of high excitement when we're out there saving lives. It's what a fireman longs for. That moment when he can help someone, whether in a road accident or a fire. Come on, ambulance. Somebody burned their food. They left their food cooking and went to sleep. This is what we hate to see. We always have to force the door to get in because oxygen displacement. Kill you. And now the smell that you uh, smell now, it's with you the rest of the night. Okay, step back, step back, don't move. How you doing? All right, just don't roll around. Keep your head just the way it is. He was in a head-on. He went over the handlebars. He doesn't know if he lost consciousness or not. He's OK. He banged his head pretty good, too. But thank God for the helmets. These periods took our minds away from past thoughts, but they are short-lived. Back in the firehouse, the men were trying to keep a brave face on things. This generation will lift a dark thread of violence from our people and our future. We will rally the world to this cause by our efforts, by our courage. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. But there was no escape. Every day there was something in the press to reignite the emotions. Every other week, it popping up in the paper about the money, Families are getting yes. and the Have resentment among firefighters and Have civilians. And it's a shame because they put a dollar value on it. They do. Take the money. Okay, we got X. $20 million, okay? $20 million divided by how many civilians lost their lives? <laughs> done. It's not but done that I know it's not done that way. And the politicians got involved. What a shame, huh? What we're talking about here? Yeah. Well, see what it's coming Talking about it helps. It's unbelievable. Is this what happens at these things, you know? A disaster? It takes this effect later on. We're still feeling it. Look at the way it's, look at how it's evolved. It's evolved into, you know, grading uh, society and our views. Well, I show you, the towers are down, but the repercussion is still being felt throughout the department, you know? So, throughout the world, throughout the world, throughout the world yeah. The argument was not about money for themselves. It was about taking care of all the families that had suffered. My firehouse had its annual picnic recently. It was the first time they'd all been together since September 11th. And for a few hours on a sunny July afternoon, the past was forgotten. But there can't have been a mother or father there who wasn't thinking of the 600 kids who now have no daddy, and the 300 wives who no longer have a husband. It's times like this we now appreciate every precious moment that life has to offer. The events of September 11th have had a major influence on how our families relate to each other. Billy O'Keefe is one of my most experienced firefighters. I think my wife uh, worries a lot uh, about it a lot more. The hugs are the hugs are uh, tighter. Um, sometimes uh, there's tears in her eyes. We'll settle up all our arguments before we leave. You know, if any any argument that we may have had. Uh, I don't leave the house mad. Um, 
and it had to be something big now to, to get us rattled. Uh, because you're, she knows as well as uh, I do, it may be the last time we see each other. The kids, too, have been badly scored. September 11th, uh, it was unfortunate, but my son's teacher thought it was a, um, in his history class, thought it was a, a piece of history that the kids should watch. And he rolled the TV set in. September 11th is my son's birthday. And um, the towers came down, and my son thought that that I had died. But then, as kids reason, he said that God wouldn't let me die on his birthday. The teacher realized at that point the look on my son as well as four, other, four or five other kids in the class. At that point, there may be five, five of sons in the class. And he asked a head count. And five or six kids raised their hand and the teacher realized he made a terrible mistake. Nine Eleven was my son Mike's birthday. And now it's a, it's a, a national tragedy. Um, and I tell him, I said, Mike, 9-11 is the happiest day of my life because you were born that day and it is the saddest day of my life uh, because I lost so many friends that day. John Viren, my aide, is also touched by it all. I live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of firemen and a lot of uh, firemen's kids go to school with my daughter and um, there were questions, uh, you know, uh, is so-and-so uh, his dad ever coming home? Uh, you know. What do you tell him? Uh, I just told her I'm home. And, uh, You move on, you know. Uh, it's, it's tough for the kids. It's the We've tried hard to give more time to our families, but however hard we try, this thing seems never to go away. Everyone can see the pain and anguish in the families of those who lost loved ones that day. But what isn't so clear is what is going on in the families of those who survived. Bob Bacon, who works with the engine company in my firehouse, was trapped in a stairwell of the North Tower. He was lucky to survive. He was one of the last firefighters to get out. His wife, Kathleen, still has concern about him. The only time that he was very emotional was, was the morning that I saw him uh, on the 12th. You know, that was, that was his really only, you know, kind of, you know, he was crying a little bit and, you know, we were clinging to each other like, oh my gosh. But, um, you know, it's, it's almost easy to forget in a way, um, you know, how close it was, and just, you just go on with, with your life every day. Um, but it's, you know, it's always in the back of your mind, and I just try to, uh, you know, give him a kiss and say,
say be careful and you know hope for the best. But Bob tells the story of the tower collapsing on him in a matter-of-fact way. I don't think the shock of it all has hit him yet, but perhaps it's his way of dealing with it. We got to the uh, 26th floor, and when the whole building uh, shook, the lights flickered, uh, pretty loud noise. Uh, we looked at each other and immediately headed right back in the stairwell, and the lieutenant had said, you know, we're leaving. And as I turned the corner on the third floor landing, the, the stairwell just erupted into a, you know, a hurricane. And this huge, incredible force of wind and debris actually came up the stairs, uh, knocked my helmet off, knocked me to the ground. It's pitch black, uh, large amounts of dust in the stairwell. So as I was crawling around to start down the next set of stairs, the landing just collapsed underneath me. So I dropped pretty much a, a full floor. When I finally came to stop, I was uh, hanging from a beam that was in between my legs. And uh, I was probably maybe four or five feet off the first floor. After maybe, I don't know, 30 or 40 seconds, you could start to hear voices in the stairwell. And, uh, tried to open your eyes up, but it was next to impossible. You can only keep your eyes open for maybe five or six seconds before the dust just forced you to shut them. And, uh, but I remember hearing voices. I remember hearing my lieutenant calling for me, asking me where I was. And then at this point, I could also start hearing other firemen in the uh, stairwell, you know, who's there, who's that, where are you? And then there was a chief that was uh, still alive for a while, probably he was alive with us for maybe an hour and a half. And then uh, we really didn't hear anything from him. But it was probably after maybe three or four hours that enough of the dust settled and everything that uh, one of the guys that was up above us, you know, said he thought he could see the sky. And, uh, you know, I remember thinking to myself, I don't know how this guy can see the sky. We're on the second floor, of, you know, of a, of a skyscraper. But, you know, he was right. As the dust settled, he was able to, to see out the top of the stairwell and he could actually see the sky. And then to see the sight walking out of the stairwell, I mean, it looked like something out of, out of a movie. You know, I couldn't even, I couldn't even believe it. You know, unless you were there, you wouldn't really believe it. You know, if you didn't know what was going on, and if you took, clicked on the TV, you'd probably thought you were watching a science fiction movie and not looking at Lower Manhattan. Home life has never been so important or so difficult. Lissy, my girlfriend, who I've known 14 years, has had a lot to contend with. He would tell me stories about Horrible stories, you know, about people, him finding remains and his, his men finding remains and, um, you know, and I felt a lot that um, he needed to talk about it, of course, and not hold that information inside because that's too much to hold in. It's too, too enormous, you know, to find people's limbs and parts of their bodies. And, when he was in the thick of it, you know, he was on edge, completely on edge, and um, drinking gallons of coffee, and he couldn't rest, you know. So that had a big effect on, on how we related to each other, because he was in such pain, you know, and it, it did impact on our relationship. You know, he was so, uh, oh, he was so, uh, exposed and vulnerable, and I think he didn't have his his calmness and his forces to to think clearly about things and 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 discuss things, you know. And I think that there were situations that Mike maybe would have handled more smoothly with me and less volatilely with me than he would have had he not been so stretched. When he would erupt, it would be with me. I think that that was the place. And I was OK with that, too. I understood that, you know. I'm patient. I'm trying to be patient, you know, with him. And I am patient with him. I think this is going to be a long time, a long, a long situation. The survivor guilt that he must be feeling and the loss of his dear friends, I mean, that takes years to, to process through that kind of loss, you know.
Arthur Lacayotis was once the battalion chief in Red Hook in Brooklyn. I've been stationed there also. On September 11, the truck company left and both it and its seven firefighters never returned. The memories of the men lost remain in the firehouse and within Arthur. He, like all of us that were there, has to keep going back to that place. Any picture in a book or newspaper brings us back to that horror. It must be a way our minds are trying to heal us back to the world we were once in. Certain images and sounds are etched in our memories and float in and out both day and night. We put ourselves in some of the situations that the helpless were in that day. As firefighters, we know what it was like in there and what it must have felt like. We keep playing the scenes over and over like a teenager with a new CD. Will it ever go away? These are the ones that are killing me. These are the ones I'll never forget. Not that, not that, that. Yeah. Hearing those bodies hit, watching them fall. One guy let go with a scream. I mean, he was like, it was like a scream of defiance rather than fear. You know, all the way to the ground until he hit. I assume it was a guy. It's, uh, I mean, and unfortunately, people know who these people are, what they wore to work that day, and what have you. Can't imagine the terror that these poor people had to do. Hidden away in Central Park is where all Manhattan 9 11 calls are answered, engine and truck companies dispatch and decisions made. For the New York Fire Department, this is where it all started that fateful morning. Assistant Commissioner Steve Gregory is head of Fire Department Communications. Many of his staff were challenged beyond belief. Fire Department 416. John Lightsey is a hero the public never see. John is our lifeline. He's the man on the end of our radios. He's the one that deals with the public cries for help. The one who calls us out, and the one who's there to help if we need it. He ran the show that day. We all know that there have been times where, you know, we were the last person to speak to these individuals. Uh, there's, quite a, there's quite a few of them that, that stick in the mind. There are a couple of them we have that I remember is that stick in mind when we had some uh, person on a, on a car in a radio at a cab um, calling for help. from the towers that, you know, the elevators, I believe it was up on the 89th floor, were about to come down. It's hard to sleep sometimes at night, a lot of times. And I find that too. I find myself waking up in the middle of the night. I wake up like at 2.39 uh, every morning for some reason. I don't yeah. know why that time, but I get up and I, I just can't fall back to sleep again. And uh, I stay up for a little while, and if I can't fall back to sleep, I watch a little TV and then ultimately, you know, go back to sleep again. But I, I do find, you know, that, uh, Sleeping at night's a little tough. It's just something. I don't know if it'll take time. I don't know if it'll, I don't know if it'll ever take go away. Is this, you, know, you wonder if you're making the right decision and should you really be sending these guys out again this many? Looking back, I think we've learned a few things, but some of the things that, that I know that I'm going to implement is not putting all of my eggs in one basket, so to speak, and, and spread my people out a little more. And as for myself, I uh, should be in a position where I get a more of an overview of the operation, 
rather than being actually involved in the on-site operation. That happened because, I guess, maybe my involvement in the 93 bombing, my knowledge there might be, uh, be able to be used at, at this situation, but of course it didn't turn out that way. By the end of May, the site at Ground Zero had almost been cleared. I went down there that day, my colleagues were searching on the final pile. It had taken 261 days to get to this point, a remarkable achievement. But sadly, what we had hoped for, the recovery of all those lost, did not come to pass. We thought in the beginning, in those early days, we would find the remains of everyone before the search ended. But the end is now. Not tomorrow, but now. One and a half million tons of debris have been removed from here. Almost 20,000 body parts have been found and tested for DNA. But of the 2,823 lost in the Twin Towers, only 1,330 have been identified. The forces generated by the collapse pulverized everything almost to dust. As I wandered around the vast area of death, my thoughts drifted back over the many days and weeks that I had spent in this sinister place. I felt I was standing in a graveyard, and the words for the departed were echoing all around me. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In the southeast corner, as if in defiance, stood the last steel pillar that once proudly supported the mighty South Tower. Covered in graffiti messages of reminders, put there not by vandals, but by members of the New York Police Department and my own fire department, this rusting monolith is to become an icon of this terrible event. you're thinking of seat seven and have room for luggage does it have a six-speed gearbox for a responsive drive and will it cost less than sixteen thousand pounds try the seat alhambra and compare it to the seven seater you were going to buy from the director of memento a brilliant detective a brutal crime he crossed the line and he didn't even blink. Once you look into the mind of this killer... Killing changes you. You'll never close your eyes again. Al Pacino. Robin Williams. Hilary Swank. Insomnia. At Vision Express, our choice of designer glasses will make your head spin. Right now, you can choose from guess ones, like these, or gamp ones, like these. Designer glasses complete with prescription lenses at an amazing £99. Vision Express Opticians. Free your arms with impulse antiperspirant. Anyone fancy a curry? Yeah. Come on. Step this way. In Saudi sun, you don't just get one, but two extra chances to realise your dreams. Voila! Hey. Get two free goes to share in Lotto Millions every Saturday with your free Sun Syndicate game card. Fantastic. And get another chance to win when you play Daily Bingo starting next week. Here you go. Cheers. Thanks a lot. A smile relaxes all the major facial muscles, setting off an emotional chain reaction that helps you feel good. Or use simple facial wipes that gently cleanse and tone in one go. That'll make you smile too. This is good. In fact, it's too good. It's 
got to go somewhere. On your hips? No. On your bum? What? Your tummy? Oi! Chewy, fruity and only 90 calories. Now she tells us. Oh! The delicious new Kellogg Special K bar. Pick one up. Buy any new PC from Curry's and we can send someone to set it all up for you. We've brilliant low prices too, like this 2 GHz Packard Bell Home Plus PC with a printer, scanner and an Intel Pentium 4 processor. For just £899, delivered free. Hi, how's it going? Fine, and he hasn't sworn once. <coughs> Curry's. No worries. On a bright day in midsummer, I set out to Staten Island. It's a place where they brought the tangible metal carnage. A place where it's going to be laid to rest. It's also the place where the final scrutiny of what is left is carried out. The final, final search, just in case there's something there. But I wasn't prepared for what was coming. This is, uh, this is a battalion chief's car. This is what I'm most used to being in at the moment. I have a very close friend, Steve Belson, who I lost, and they never found him. And he was driving the chief, and actually the chief he was driving, Oreo Palmer, was also a close friend. We worked together for years. So now this hits home for these, for me, right now at this rank. Oh God, it's unbelievable, the damage to these things. This is a fire marshal's car. Totally crushed. The north walkway had been leveled somewhat, not totally. But just south of that, there were the apparatus lined up against the curb. And they were crushed. And they were covered with debris. And I went down into a void to make sure it was safe for the men to go down into that void and into another void with a guy from FEMA. And he had a search cam. And at one point, he also had a dog with him, too. Uh, we had got an odor, and I crawled a little further down, and I found one of the, one of the brothers underneath uh, a rear mount. And you know, we verified it with the camera and, of course, with the dog, and it was just something that was just unbelievable. Now, eight months later, I look at these things, it brings me right back to day one. Are you pinned in a piece of apparatus? I was, that's all. All right, we're going to get some members over there to assist you. If you have help, on the way. Do you receive that? There is help on the way. These are testimony to my friends. It's a testimony to my coworkers. Guys that worked for me, guys I worked with. You know, I didn't know this was going to be like this, but this is it's horrible. Horrible. This is the cab to the apparatus. This is the tip of the area ladder. Comes over the front of the rig. And the officer and the chauffeur and the men sit right behind it. Can you imagine getting out of your apparatus and that happening to you? These things. Young kids come in and make sure these things are folded perfectly in the morning and when they go to a fire, put everything away. Look at the folds. They're perfect. They should just leave this just the way it is and make this the memorial. Yeah.
enough. Reeling from the shock, we drove away, but there was more to come. All the debris has come here for the police and FBI to check it one more time. Somewhere in that finely sifted heap of debris are the remains of my missing brothers. It's unbelievable. Now in there, if you can see, see the belts, the belts coming yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. Those are all the detectives in there, and they watch as the debris comes out on the belt. And now they go in there, and they spend their day in there, and they just watch the belt. If something comes across, they stop the belt and take it. And uh, it comes through here, then it goes through a finer sifting machine, and it comes out like that at the end. Then that's all, that's all picked up and used as fill. Day and night, we continually go back to the front line. It's a battle we love to fight. My men and I can't get enough of it as we push ourselves, our bodies to the limit. We try to hold the line at bay, hoping it won't fight back and overwhelm us. But for some on that fateful day, the line was crossed, never to return. We are soldiers in a war that never ends.